Good evening and welcome to our public worship service here at St John's Presbyterian Church Annaly with our resident pastor, Reverend Martin Duffield, leading worship this evening. Again, as always, we commend to your prayers those of our church family members. There are those dealing with bereavement or dealing with uh, current health issues. Also commending those of our aged church family and retirement complexes and those we know of with long-term illness. Activities for the coming week, please note the bulletin for this new month that we'll be moving into this week. This Thursday evening is usual our even Bible study via Zoom at 7pm. Next Saturday, 6th of May, our prayer meeting is usual here in the vestry, 7.15am, and there'll be a working bee around the church and the grounds at approximately 9am. Next Sunday services, God willing as usual, morning and evening. In the morning, one of our retired pastors, Reverend John Roth, and in the evening again, our own Pastor Martin in the evening. Just again, a reminder to our local folk that the church car park will be refurbished in this coming week and will not be available for congregational use. It should be available for next Sunday. We are now encouraged to engage in personal preparation just prior to our call to worship. Thank you. Worship the Lord our God. His word provides for us the call this evening from the 95th Psalm and verses 6 and 7, not just 6 but 6 and 7, where the psalmist writes, O come, let us worship and bow down, let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. So we have come to worship and to bow down this evening to give him the glory and the praise of who he is and all he has done for us in his mercies. We're going to sing an introit which is taken from one of our hymns, but it's uh, the introit, Exalt the Lord, his praise will come.
our glorious God and Father in heaven. We have come to worship you this evening in the name of the Son and in the power of the Holy Spirit. We engage you in humble reverence and with great awe the Godhead as you've revealed yourself to us in Scripture. We bow before you as Father, Son and Spirit, acknowledging you as one God, the same in substance and equal in power as to the persons. We glorify you in our praises this evening as one God, God, one Lord who has created all, who rules over all and who is in all. And we acknowledge tonight the privilege that we have to know you, to be able to worship you acceptably through our Lord Jesus Christ, and especially through his sacrifices of himself, with the aid of the Spirit of the Lord, who teaches us to pray. O oh God, in this hour as we meet with you, we seek your glory in every part of this service. We may benefit through edification from the scripture and praise, but we have not come here for that purpose. We have come to give, give the gifts of mind, minds in faith and hearts in love, and wills in sacrifice for your praise and your glory. Like our Lord Jesus, we serve you with the sacrifice of our whole being, in this, and this service is the highest expression of that desire. So we pray that you would accept us in Jesus Christ the Beloved, that you would delight in our offerings of praise and prayer. May our minds and our wills be bent to your pleasure, for we seek these things alone for your glory and through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We go to sing the hymn when all your mercies, O oh my God, my thankful soul surveys. This evening, this time from the New Testament in 2 Corinthians in chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. Verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in all Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. You also, helping together in prayer for us, that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly toward you. For we are not writing any other things to you than what you read or understand. Now I trust you will understand even to the end, as also you have understood us in part, that we are your boast, as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. And to God be all the glory. Amen. So let's bow again before our God and this time confess our sins to him. We might receive his mercy. Let's all pray. Our Holy Father in heaven, as we have been reminded tonight of some of the aspects of human folly and failure, we may well see ourselves mirrored in these observations of your servant Solomon. We recognise that we are children of prosperous times and that we may well have suddenly fallen into the errors of prosperous times. We see the evidence like the failure to get priorities right in terms of personal life and health or family or church and even sometimes our immortal souls. We confess to the persuasive and seductive power of the world and all the things that it offers to cause us these imbalances and failures, things that are innocent often and even noble, but which our hearts can engage sinfully over and overindulge in. We understand the blinding power of sin, that we can slip into these faults that can plunge us into ruin of many kinds or at least before then hinder us from better and more productive achievements, whether it is in our work or in our families or in the church or in our personal lives. If we are guilty of any of this failure tonight, our God, convict us now, or convict us as we hear it. Chastise us now, or chastise us then, and provoke us whenever we are, whenever we are confronted with this, to a holy determination to rid ourselves of these issues and errors and all their fruit in our lives especially rid us of the sins that so easily entangle us that are often associated. O oh God, open our eyes by whatever means to ourselves so that we may see us as you see us, to see our lives and our priorities as you currently see them and not as we think they are. 
Show us the pathways of peace and life, the pathways of discipline and even sacrifice, that we may bear good fruit in every area of our lives without harming any. Help us to live as you would have us to live in every area of those lives, as good and faithful servants, for we ask it again in our Saviour Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn of brotherly love. Uh, it's the uh, Psalm 133, how good a thing it is, how pleasant to be. that you will read for the clarity of the truth that it reveals. We shall now move to um, the uh, reading, the second reading which, from which we'll take the sermon tonight um, and it's Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and Ecclesiastes comes after the Psalms and the Proverbs in the middle of the scriptures. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verses 4 to 16. Verse 4, again, I saw that for all toil and every skilful work, a man is envied by his neighbour. This also is vanity and grasping for the wind. The fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. Better a handful with quietness than both hands full, together with toil and grasping for the wind. Then I returned, and I saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone without companion. He has neither son nor brother. Yet there is no end to all his labours, nor is his eye satisfied with riches. But he never asks, For whom do I toil and deprive myself of good? This also is vanity and a grave misfortune. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labour. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, who can withstand him? And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Better a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who will be admonished no more. For he comes out of prison to be king, although he was born poor in his kingdom. 
I saw all the living who walk under the sun. They were with the second youth who stands in his place. There was no end of all the people over whom he was made king. Yet those who come afterward will not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and grasping for the wind. And again, to God be all the glory. Amen. Let's give thanks for the offering uh, which is taken up at the front uh, of the church or at both doors uh, or else it's given through the week uh, and then we shall ask God's blessing upon the sermon later this evening. Let's all pray. Oh Lord our God, we thank you for the labours of life and for the fruit of those labours. Thank you for health and strength to earn or to have earned income which we are now glad to give to you to share with others. And as we love our neighbours in the mission and the ministry fields, may they know your blessing through these gifts this evening. Give wisdom to our managers as always in disseminating them for the good of your people, the progress of the gospel, and especially for the glory of your name. As we come later to the word of God, our Father, grant the Spirit attend every word that has been prepared power and for life-changing good toward greater holiness and goodness in our lives. For more faithful and effective witness, bless the hearers with receptive hearts. Increase their faith and their faithfulness through it. And all to the glory of your name, for we ask it again in our Saviour Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So we shall sing together, Gracious Spirit, Holy Ghost, taught by thee we covet most.
tonight to the book of Ecclesiastes uh, under a very broad subject, Your Neighbour and You. Perhaps the, the title might have been more to do with foolishness and wisdom because a lot of what we shall cover deals with the foolishness uh, that people exhibit in their lives. So we begin with uh, the truth that the wisdom literature of scripture is a veritable treasure trove of material for what non-religious people would call life coaching or if you like from a religious perspective uh, practical holiness. Proverbs is the greatest storehouse of this but, but Ecclesiastes has it too. We're going to deal with that here under the heading of your neighbour and you. Ecclesiastes 4, 4 to 16, the Holy Spirit deals with the relationship between people from a number of different angles and in so doing teaches us better how to glorify God in our lives. So tonight I'm going to look at the envious neighbour and the foolish neighbour and then the contented neighbour um, and uh, next time we will look at some more neighbours in this passage. When we look at people like this we should not be, be merely be looking to understand their flaws in character but of course we should also be considering ours. Scripture is a mirror, of course. We're looking into the mirror of Scripture and we should not be surprised if in some of the more negative information we do see ourselves reflected. So with the front rear vision in full view, let's begin with the envious neighbour. So there are two possible issues of note in chapter 4 and verse 4 of Ecclesiastes for us to consider in order to learn from it practical matters for living. First is the danger of expectations of others, and second is the ugly fruit of envy. Envy is one of the more ugly of human traits, and it isn't simply the attitude of the person, it is what comes toward others of the people that are envied, and here is the reverse that describes this for us. Again, I saw that for all the toil and for every skilful work, a man is envied by his neighbour. And this is also vanity and a grasping for the wind. So what does this mean? The Hebrew word for um, skilful, skilful work, can sometimes mean successful. The idea is that the result is admirable and complete. What the preacher is talking about here is the reaction of people to that skill or success. It may not be true here, but it is often true that people do things expecting kudos or praise for their efforts. They do something well or even really, really well or perfect and expect that people will have the same opinion as them. Worse, these unfortunate people don't realise that sometimes not only do people not appreciate what is done, but but they are actually jealous of their accomplishments. And the result of that is the opposite of praise. It's more than a letdown. Other people aren't always the way we wish them to be and sometimes they are precisely the opposite. So when the envious person doesn't deliver the praise or worse criticises the work, we have the opposite expectation. Letdown can be more than deflating. It can be perplexing if not painful. If the purpose of our lives then is the praise of men, our efforts will be rendered vanity very, very quickly. And there is a warning in that thought on its own. Labour has to be for other reasons, preferably only for other reasons, like the glory and the pleasure of, pleasure of God and the benefit of the blessing of others. Or if we can be selfish for a moment, our own satisfaction, and to be content with that, it is all, after all, a biblical aspiration. Well, here is the response in terms of criticism explained by one scholar. This is a man who is envied by his neighbour. Instead of the honour and recompense which he deserves, he meets with nothing but envy and many evil fruits of that. And again, another writer concludes, success itself is no guarantee of happiness. The malice and ill feeling which in er invariably occasions are necessarily a source of pain and distress. Do you think that this is bad? Do you think that people who envy try to hurt them or out of, hurt them out of petty jealousy? Well, of course, some people do. We all know the stories from our lives and others of malicious jealousy. 
John Gill reminds of another type of jealousy that leads to an even worse outcome. He says, this is true of moral works, which are right when done from a right principle, from the love of God, in faith, and with a view to the glory of God, and which when done, even ever so well done, draw upon a man the envy of the wicked, as may be observed in the case of Cain and Abel. And he quotes 1 John 3.12, and here is 1 John 3.12, For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and who murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil, and his brothers were righteous. The righteousness of a faithful person can be subject to deep hatred, as that righteousness stings the conscience of the jealous, conscience of the jealous person. A person who cannot live up to that high moral or ethical standard and wants to see it obliterated or silenced. The Apostle sees that this is an ongoing problem and he warns his readers not to imitate this by implication to be prepared for such treatment. Jesus reminds us of this when he said in Matthew 5.10, Blessed are those who are persecuted. Why? For the sake of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So before I leave this matter of the maliciously envious neighbour about whom we need to be warned, I wanted to put a question to you. How do you know if you are sinfully envious? How do you know that? Do you know how to test your own heart in this matter? The American preacher Tim Keller defined the test of envy this way. He said, if you are upset when the person succeeds, or if you rejoice when they fall, then you are sinfully envious in your heart. I'll put it another way. If you hate it when they succeed, and you love it when they fail, you are sinfully envious. If you grieve when they succeed, and you rejoice when they fall, you are wickedly envious. Here is Paul's counsel to us regarding the biblical approach to all people and their success and their experiences, but especially in context here, 1 Corinthians 12, 26, our fellow Christians. Paul said, if one member suffers, all members suffer with it. And if one member is honoured, all members rejoice with it. Here he is again regarding our attitude to each other's high and low moments in life from Romans 12.15. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. If you can't do this, then you need to ask why. And you need to ask God for help to change your wicked attitude. It is, after all, a poisonous state of heart to possess, and one which will harm you more than the very person you envy. Can I repeat that? Sinful envy is a poisonous state of heart to possess, and one which will harm you more than the person you envy wrongly. Or as an old friend of mine once put it, you will be stewing in your own poison and you'll be the only one who will get damaged out of that. So, that's the envious neighbour. Let's look now at a very common category in the wisdom literature, which is the foolish neighbour. From the sinfully jealous neighbour and his depressing effect on the success of others, the preacher addresses uh, the extreme folly in laziness. I'm going to start with some case examples to begin with, just to whet your appetite. I lived next door to a man who bought a small metal pool for his children, filled it full of water, got inside as soon as it was full and led on the walls and collapsed the whole thing. He flooded his neighbour's yards downstream, but he left the mess gathering moss and mosquitoes for months and months afterwards. Complete waste of money and destroyed it. He didn't build it properly. I knew another man who was so lazy, his wife complained to me one day that she came home and found 15 empty coffee cups wringing his chair from a single day on the couch as a couch potato. 15 empty coffee cups. 
I don't know what state his heart was in at the end of the day with all that caffeine. The same man was renowned for leaving electrical power tools out in the yards for months, completely destroying them. I know people who would describe this as malignant dumb or as pathological laziness. So I've illustrated the point of the lazy fool and how destructive a fool can be. So here is the verse that tells us, the fool folds his hands and he consumes his flesh. And what you've just heard is examples of a man consuming his own flesh through just sheer laziness. They destroy what they have purchased with the labour of their own hands. They tear down their houses and dishonour their own labour, wasting its fruits instead of adding to it by the things they have purchased and their proper care. The same is true of health and diet, gluttony and a refusal to exercise, tear down the body, which is not our own but a gift from God. Lazy people inevitably eat poorly. They won't discipline themselves and thereby they damage and dishonour God's gift to them in their physical being. The book of Proverbs has much to say on laziness, what the old King James called the sluggard. The despair of seeing a successful person insulted by a neighbour is followed by the despair of seeing a neighbour who ruins himself and his wealth, his substance, his life through sheer laziness. The Hebrew says he eats his own flesh. He eats his own flesh. We could say that he destroys himself with his own hands. Matthew Henry said idleness is a sin that is its own punishment. Some suggest that this is literal in the case of a man, an ancient man, who leaves himself with nothing, especially during the great ancient famines. And cannibalism results, as warned about in the Deuteronomic curses of Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26. The reality is more likely, however, that it is a metaphor of self-destruction. Laziness is a form of self-destruction, and sadly, if it is a person with dependence, either family, or friends or workmates. Not only they, he is damaged, but they are damaged and ruined by the loafer, or as we would say in Australia, the bludger. If we take the principle into a Christian life again, we have the danger of lazily neglecting the faith in such a way and to such a degree that a person can destroy their own souls and their eternal future. When people are converted, and they rest on their conversion experience. They are destroying themselves for laziness caused by that complacency. I made a decision for God or for Jesus 20 years ago. The letter to the Hebrews contains a warning, warnings like the following in Hebrews 6, 11, 12. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to, be, to the full assurance of hope until the end that you do not become sluggish but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And again in Hebrews 2.3, a more ominous warning. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? So the work of preserving and improving the soul is a work. And when we become complacent, when we are not diligent to make our election and calling sure, as Peter said in 2 Peter 1.9, when we neglect to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord, as Peter said in 2 Peter 3.18, then we are destroying the metaphorical house that is our faith. You can look around you and see those who have folded their hands and ceased to work at their salvation, much less with fear and trembling, as Paul says to the Philippians. And their lot is a terrifying one. A fool may destroy his physical wealth and consume his assets or others, but the fool who neglects his soul through laziness consumes and destroys his or her immortal soul. And there is no compensation for that and there is no coming back from that laziness. So what are the signs of folding hands in laziness in this situation? It is when people either fall away from or do not take up the discipline of growing in grace diligently, using the means of grace and grace provided by their church. And what are, what are they that the spiritual loafer neglects? Let me give you the obvious ones. 
It is the study, not just the reading, but the study of Scripture. It is the labour of prayer, not just prayer, but the work of praying for yourself and for others. It is proper attendance at public worship, as you have opportunity, where there is a more ground an opportunity for personal growth. It is the proper exercise, the practical proper exercise of spiritual gifts in the body of the church. And lastly, it is the labour, it is the battle, it is the struggle of resisting sin in the world about which people can get very lazy and slip into evil. I have four stages of apostasy for individuals and societies. And they are the following. Formalism, nominalism, scepticism, antagonism. Formalism is when you believe orthodox things but you are only going through the public motions. They're no longer in your heart. You're just doing them to do them. Nominalism, which is the next collapse down in apostasy, is when you still believe those orthodox things, but you even drop the public activities. The Western world is full of these people, nominal, nominal believers. Skeptics and antagonists are basically hostile to the faith. They become active against the faith. Lazy professors of religion start by going through the motions with no heart or enthusiasm, drifting off into other loves, and eventually they lapse into nominalism with a head knowledge but zero practice of Christianity in the life. By now the spiritual hands are completely folded and they have fallen asleep into a deathly sleep of disobedience and complacency and neglect. It is set in and it's dangerous. It is a warning to us to watch our life and doctrine carefully, as Paul told Timothy, lest without realising it, you slip into a dangerous state of lethargy and risk either the discipline of God, the painful discipline of God in your life, or you risk exposing your faith and your profession of faith as having been a deadly delusion. Well, let's turn now to another aspect of life which has to do with the issue of contentedness, or perhaps we could say malcontentedness. We are talking about the danger of discontent, the discontented neighbour. Solomon goes on with these words in verse 6, better a handful with quietness than both hands full together with toil and grasping for the wind. Better a handful with quietness and calm than both hands full together with toil and grasping for the wind. Now, this verse is actually quite controversial among the scholars. There are two views as to what it means and exactly who is speaking here. So I'm going to deal with both because there are lessons to be learned from both. Firstly, some say that it is the lazy man we've just been talking about who is justifying folding his hands and not working too hard lest he ends up grasping for the wind. Paraphrasing him, one does, not want to work, one does not want to overwork pointlessly to your own heart. Better to aim for a little and be happy with a life that is stress-free. Well, the Proverbs do have a few kinds of these, what I would call cop-out excuses from hard work in this case. Like this one from Proverbs 22, 13. The lazy man said, there is a lion outside, I shall be slain in the streets. In other words, it's a ridiculous excuse. It is a case of any excuse will do, and it is a foolish and disingenuous ground for avoiding work. It is like the unemployed man who wants to stay on the doll and lists his qualifications as a lion tamer, figuring that there aren't too many openings for that sort of employment. You could also list astronaut as well. You know that Jesus told the parable of the wedding banquet in which people were invited but they gave ridiculous excuses for not attending, some of which were clearly ludicrous, but indicative of the extent to which some people will go to avoid the implications of attending the banquet and all that goes with the banquet of God. After all, who would, who would buy land that they had never seen? Who would buy oxen that they've never tried? It's like buying a used car that you've never tried. Who would turn down a chance for a banquet with a new wife 
What better thing can a husband and wife, a new husband and wife do than to feast together? Laziness as a sin is often involved with self-deceit and self-justification. I believe there is an Arabic saying which says, why do today what you can put off till tomorrow? Any excuse will do. What is the danger in these sorts of dishonest excuses for not carrying out essential tasks, responsibilities and working hard? In the case of the Christian faith, with the excuses Jesus mentioned, all you do is excuse yourself all the way to hell. If the highway to hell is paved with good intentions, it's also littered with lousy excuses. The other possibility of this verse, better a handful of quietness than both hands full together with toil and grasping for wind, is the value of contentment. That's what other scholars see this teaching. Better a handful with quietness than to have both hands full together with toil and grasping after the wind. We will see this next time in verse 8. It is a principle which takes us back to the whole question of balance in life's pursuits. It is such an important issue because good men and not a few women have ruined their lives through hands full of work and the accompanying stress and physical exhaustion in grasping for the wind. If you get it wrong, as many do, you damage yourself and those around you, especially those who depend upon you. The same concern is captured in a number of places, but here is one of the more well-known ones from Proverbs 15, 16, 17. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than a great treasure with trouble. Better is a dish of vegetables where love is than a fattened ox with hatred. Being content with enough is a legitimate reason for avoiding overwork, not for avoiding work itself, which was the first misunderstanding of this, well, first verse, first misunderstanding of this verse. Solomon here warns against what I would call overliving. Overliving, if I could call it that. And many people, many people today overlive. That means they jam too much activity into their lives. They jam too much stuff into their houses. They pursue great treasure and they don't realise that they don't need it. And that in so pursuing it, they are damaging relationships, family and health. But we've also already heard they can also damage their faith and their church as they get their priorities distorted by greater and greater success or desires for success. Two things come from this in Proverbs 15, 16, 17. Trouble and hatred, stressed, troubled and hatred stressed families tend to have troubles like conflict and disturbance. And with that become emotional exchanges, insults, hostility and hatred. In other words, the two verses blend together in their um, cause and effect. One of the things that I constantly remind myself of as a preacher and as a person, and I commend it to you as a principle, as an antidote to this kind of uh, failure, is that people always come before things. People come before things. The care of a sick parishioner is more important than a perfect sermon. It is the ideal if you can do both adequately. But if something must be sacrificed, it is the thing that must be neglected, not the person. If in pursuing material or other dreams, we lose the fear of the Lord or fail to love others, then we have chosen a poor option and it's others who may pay the price, not simply us. It is much better than to have sufficient, to have food and covering for that is enough, said the Apostle Paul. That should be the matter, motto. Do I have food in covering? Well, then that is enough. We taught this to our children. The handful of quietness is a way of saying contentment with a modest and sufficient supply. And within that, of course, can be nurtured the fear of the Lord and the love of the family or the marriage or the friendship. 
because you're giving yourself time, not pursuing the excesses. These are things that make for a fruitful and a peaceful life, whether Old or New Testament. Remember, there is a New Testament injunction too, in places like 1 Thessalonians 4.11, where Paul says, I want you to aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your own hands as we commanded you. And again in 1 Timothy 2.2, the Holy Spirit through Paul also says, as the goal of prayer, our prayers for our rulers, is to live a quiet and productive life as follows. He said, pray for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and a peaceful life in all godliness and reverence. When we labour for things that ultimately are passing and of limited value, um, and they cause us loss at the expense of the precious in relationships and the eternal in the neglect of the soul, then we mark ourselves as fools who sell the precious for the worthless, the real for the passing and the imaginary. The fruit of that is the neglected Christian home and the family that is devoid of the fear of God and poisoned by the hatred of its members. And as a result, it cannot be light and salt to its neighbours, but it brings the name of God and the good name of the church into disrepute. If I can just leave my notes for a minute. Um, James Dobson said, we have been so busy in the late 20th century giving our children the things that we didn't have in the early 20th century that we have forgotten to give them the things we did have. We have been so busy giving our children the things that we didn't have, the material things, that we have forgotten to give them the things that we did have, the spiritual and moral things, in our childhoods. If we are not careful, we will be fools in the eyes of the watching world. For many of those people are no fools because of common grace. And they can see our failures for what they are if we are guilty of them. The quiet and the peaceful life in all godliness and reverence is an admirable life, even to those outside of the church. And it should be our goal because it is God's goal in true holiness. So when you see the outcome of these errors that Solomon saw in others, in his neighbours, each one of them drives him to sigh, vanity of vanities, all is vanity, and rightly so. It's all so unnecessary if they could be reached with wisdom, if only they could lift their head out of the trough of awful self-indulgent laziness, or out of the trough of the pursuit of prizes and achievements and rewards. If only we could see the truth about what, that what we are doing is lazy on the one hand or over-living on the other. They are the opposite attitude, but they are sharers in the destructive consequences. Both of these ruin the self and they can ruin others. God has given us the wisdom literature of the scriptures to this very end. And this is why it is the height of stupidity to ignore the Old Testament, and in this case the wisdom literature. It is, after all, the wisdom of the ages. It puts a wise head on young shoulders, or as the psalmist said of the law, it makes, the wise, it makes wise the simple. It is a good thing and an essential thing that we are all reconciled to God through the gospel and that we understand the atonement and how it enables us the forgiveness of sins and cleanses sin through forgiveness. But the Saviour commends to us the scriptures which is more than this and it includes the whole of the Old Testament for our edification. As Paul told Timothy famously in 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 16 where he speaks about the inspiration of God's word for the equipping of the saints in ministry. The Old Testament doesn't just point to Christ or reveal him in his work. It reveals also the way of life that his death enables us to embrace. It is a way of wisdom. It is a way of health for us and for all those around us to whom we are called to love. Amen. Let's pray.
Our Father in heaven, we thank you again for this sobering reminder of the mistakes that even sometimes the most well-meaning and otherwise wise people can fall into. And we do pray tonight that you would help us to learn from their mistakes and not to make the mistakes ourselves. That we should learn from the scars of others and not our own scars. We thank you for the wisdom of the scriptures and for not only the knowledge of salvation but also the knowledge of sanctification which is contained in these precious words of this portion of Ecclesiastes tonight. Lord, equip us to be more faithful servants, to be wise servants, to bring glory to your name, to be light and salt in the earth because we are wise with all that we say and do in our work and in our play and in our family and in our church life. We commend ourselves to you in this word for our hearts. In Jesus' name, Amen. So we're going to sing together the uh, hymn, O God of Mercy, God of Might, in Love and Pity Infinite.
the service by singing together the blessing of Aaron. The Lord bless you and keep you.